Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. Live from the world-famous Sunset Gower Studios in Hollywood, the best of a generation has arrived. Stories that matter and people who are making a difference. This is the Millennial Report. From the trending desk, here's Wake. Oh, you betcha. Welcome to our Be Better broadcast today. We learn from author Taylor Pearson as he shares his thoughts on the mask that we wear and how by changing our venue, we can change our lives. After that, we dive into what no one ever taught you, but you still need to know about success. As uh, James Maloney, author of the book, The Art of Success, drops by. And, uh, you know, if there's time, this election day here on November the 8th, I sure think it would be proper to lay America to rest. That's right. Lady Liberty has sung her last song. So if we have some time, we're going to remember her the way that we should. It's all coming up on today's The Millennial Reports. Hello, friends, and uh, welcome aboard. I'm columnist for The Blaze, Wade Heath, joining you here live from the Sunset Gower Studios in the heart of Hollywood, where just blocks away, they are about to burn Donald Trump's star in effigy. And uh, I got to tell you, there is a battle about to begin. There are two sides forming just around his star right now. Um, So I will steer clear of that on the way out today and leave the city before it erupts in flames. But other than that, what a joy it is to be here. Don't you agree? I sure think so. And it has been a long road. Now that we are here, now that it is November 8th and the election is today, we have come so far, haven't we? We've experienced a heck of a lot. And I gotta say, it's about dang time that it comes to a close. We've seen a lot of personalities on Uh, the big debate stage. We've seen a lot of personalities campaigning. We've seen politicians everywhere over the last year and a half try to vie for our confidence and our vote. But in the end, we picked the two worst possible Americans to represent us, and today we will crown the worst of all. Very excited to see who that ends up being. I have a a uh, tongue-in-cheek problem today. I don't know if you can pick up on that. I'm not bitter at all. But our friends at CNN decided to do something for us, and I greatly appreciate what they've done. Uh, It's a little little look back at the good times, a little look back at the memories. And uh, I say, you know, we should uh, remember all the good times that we shared together. Take a look. Okay. I have said I made a mistake using my personal email. I regret that. I said it, I was wrong, and I apologize. Why aren't you bringing up the emails? I'd like to know. Okay, we'll talk about a super predator. No, 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 no. Selling watches in Manhattan. What, like with a cloth or something? No. Texas Senator Ted Cruz. Please clap. (laughs) Trying to put her pneumonia diagnosis in perspective. She's supposed to fight all of these different things, and she can't make it 15 feet to her car. Somebody's sniffing here. I think it's her sniffs. And you know what they say about men with small hands? I guarantee you there's no problem. I guarantee you. You've called women you don't like fat pigs, dogs, slobs, 
and disgusting animals. Blood coming out of her, wherever. And I certainly will not apologize for doing good journalism. I don't really blame you because you're doing your thing. Donald, you're a sniveling coward and leave Heidi the hell alone. Lion Ted Cruz, Lion Ted. Vote your conscience, vote for candidates up and down the ticket. We are talking to Ted Cruz, who's a friend of mine and a good guy. Cruz this afternoon releasing a statement announcing he'll vote for the Republican nominee on election day. I didn't start uh, it. But sir, sir, with all due respect, that's the argument of a five-year-old. I didn't start it. No, I wish you were in high school. I could take him behind the gym. What's the best way to reach you? Email? You guys are down. And it makes Says sense who? that there would... Says polls. who? Most of them. All of them? Let's do it. If you're both screaming at each other, the viewers won't be able to hear either of you. Okay. So I please would, don't I talk over I each was... other. Would you want the President of the United States to be up at 4 a.m. encouraging people to go look for a sex tape? <laughs> yeah, but it's worth looking for, Anderson. It's just awfully good that someone with the temperament of Donald Trump is not in charge of the law in our country. Because you'd be in jail. A lot of people who go into prison go into prison straight, and when they come out, they're gay. Sort of like the textbook definition of a racist comment. When they go low, we go high. He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? I hate to tell you. Come on, man. The American people are sick and tired of hearing about your damn emails. I don't know if it's the right number. Let's try it. 202. And what is Aleppo? I will tell you at the time. I'll keep you in suspense. You whipped out that Mexican thing again. What I call the basket of deplorables. Such Social a nasty one. Trust. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. <laughs> Mr. Khan joins us once again. Federal Judge Gonzalo Curiel, former Miss Universe, Alicia Machado. Ken Bone. D's nuts. Scott Baio. FBI Director James Comey and Attorney General Loretta Lynch. Our colors don't run a I think she might believe me that I love having a baby crying while I'm speaking. Mamma mia. I have decided in 2020 to run for president. Now, in case you are... Uh, just listening to us and not watching us. That was something to behold because there was a terrorist threat uh, thrown out there at the end by Kanye West that he was going to be running for president in 2020. But given our track record, I say, yeah, bring it on. It's probably going to happen. Good riddance, election 2016. Uh, can't wait to get rid of you and move on. Maybe we'll start to heal tomorrow. That would be nice. Now, from that to this, we are going to be talking about changing your location to potentially change your life. Joining us now, author of the book, The End of Jobs, is Taylor Pearson. Taylor, welcome to the Millennial Report. Thank you for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, likewise. Tell me something. We're going to dive right into this. Uh, Maxwell Maltz, he had a theory that you went with for your article that uh, sort of detailed this idea of changing your location to change your life. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so Maltz was a plastic surgeon, um, and he was one of the early people to discover what we now call cognitive behavioral therapy, or sometimes it's called neurolinguistic programming. Um, but what he noticed was, um, he was a plastic surgeon, as I said, and he had a very small fraction of his patients who he would operate on, and the surgery, the surgery would go fine. Like they would, the patients would go home and see their families, and they say, you know, oh my gosh, it looks amazing, you look just like you did. Um, before the accident or before whatever the event was, but the patient themselves didn't actually, um, when they looked in the mirror, they still saw themselves post-accident with whatever the disfigurations, whatever the problems they had were. And so what he kind of slowly began to realize is that his service, what he was really selling, the service he was providing was identity change, that by changing their um, physical appearance. It was changing the way these people thought about themselves, though not for everyone. And so um, the article uh, is kind of talking about how do we do that by changing our location. I see. And, you know, you move from that to this idea of masks and the masks that we wear. So identity change and masks that seems a little uh, logical to me, right? You, you connect the two there. Uh, explain a little bit to us about the idea of the masks that we wear. Sure. So um, there was a guy named Keith Johnstone. He was an improv professor. He was actually the first guy to do uh, or teach improv. Um, he was in, based in the UK. And one of the things he saw that was similar to kind of Malt's findings was uh, 
the people that did improv, oftentimes their first breakthrough came, they really kind of got the hang of improv um, when they did mask work for the first time. So he would make these kind of crazy looking masks and they would put them on and they would look at themselves in the mirror with the mask. And all of a sudden they would start to take on the personas of these characters, right? In the same way a patient looking in the mirror um, would see himself in one way, someone looking in the mirror wearing a mask would see themselves. And all of a sudden these people could kind of uh, release themselves and say, hey, I'm doing improv, I'm playing a role here, I don't have to act like myself, no one's going to judge me because, um, you know, I do something stupid, or I do something silly while I'm on the stage. It's, you know, I'm wearing a mask and this is improv. Now, you had an experience where, um, you know, you, you got to wear several masks, uh, and you document this in the piece where you discuss how you studied abroad, and you found uh, that you could wear several masks and sort of find which one fit you best. Take us through that experience of, of living abroad and what that was like to live through a different mask, a different prism, and, um, you know, put, put this into some terms that we can understand, because I think that there are a lot of millennials that, you know, grow up in the same place, um, you know, for 20-plus for years and perhaps don't understand the concept of, you know, if, if I moved somewhere else, uh, I might have the opportunity to wear a different mask, to be a different person. Um, you experienced it. What was that like? So I'm from, I have a similar story. I grew up, um, I lived the first 18 years of my life in Memphis, Tennessee. That's where I was born and raised. Um, and over a two-year period, I went to, to about three different countries and lived in them for somewhere between six to 12 months. What I realized over the course of that experience was um, exactly what you said, which is I showed up in this place and no one knew who I was. You know, so all this, um, you know, baggage, all this history I had with me um, when I, you know, went out and hung out with my friends. They said, you know, you used to do this when you were 12, you used to do this when you were 14 or whatever. Um, I could kind of reinvent my whole history. I could reinvent who I was very, very quickly. Whereas, you know, if you're trying to do that with your same friends, it, it's very hard. It takes a much longer time and a lot of times. Um, you can't do it, right? Because there's, you've always been this person, why do you want to change into someone totally different? And so what I found through that experience was I was able to reinvent myself um, very, very quickly. Um, I was able to kind of throw away all my past history and say, I'm not sure I want to be um, that person in that way anymore. Um, and I was able to kind of try on new masks or new identities and figure out, okay, this is the person I, I want to be and this is who I feel comfortable as. You go on to say here that through travel and changing locations, we can try lots of different masks and refine those down into creating the mask we want to be at any given time. You also say that we're the first generation with the ability to leverage our locations to create more meaningful lives. Explain that a little bit. So I think one of the things, and this was certainly um, my experience, is oftentimes it is hard to do something you kind of internally feel like you want to do, but maybe isn't congruent. Um, with your past. You know, you are known as a particular type of person. Um, you're known as having certain habits, certain things you do. Uh, and maybe you say, I want to get rid of these. I want to make a, um, a significant change. And as I said, I think one of the easiest ways to do that is um, to get up somewhere and move. Uh, and that's getting uh, easier and easier, I think. Um, you know, the ability to, 100 years ago, to go to Europe, right, was you had to get on uh, a boat, and you had to sit on the boat for a month, and it took a month to get there. There's a steam across the Atlantic, right? And now all of a sudden you can buy, you know, like a discount plane ticket for um, $500. Sure. Or moving to another city, all of a sudden these are really uh, increasingly accessible options. And so I think there is this unique opportunity now, more so than at any time in the past, to say, hey, you know, things aren't, I'm not really on the trajectory, I'm not really on the path that I want to be on right now. Um, and I need to make a radical change. And one way to do that is just to pick up and go somewhere else. What I like uh, along those lines is that you say that the real leverage is uh, that when you hop on a plane uh, and move to some place like, say, Vietnam, and you're, you're talking about this for more uh, entrepreneurs uh, to do, but you say the, the real leverage is that when you hop on a plane and move to a place like Vietnam or New York or Berlin, uh, that you're not taking a trip, you're giving yourself the opportunity to put on a new mask. And I think that so many millennials don't look at it like that. I um, mean, you know, they might have to be that same person in their mind, and they think, oh, I, I need to carry over who I was into uh, who I'm going to continue to be. Uh, but you say that you aren't wearing the mask um, uh, that your parents or school or your friends assigned to you. You're able to try on lots of different masks and slowly, deliberately craft the mask that you want to wear. Tell me now, what mask are you wearing that you're most happy with? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, 
I think the mask I, I'm most happy with now is, uh, I would say like the writer mask, that writing is something I've always really enjoyed doing, I always wanted to do, and it was never something, it was kind of weird, it was like why, it was growing up I didn't know anyone that was a professional writer or author, um, and I didn't really feel comfortable telling people that initially that was what I wanted to do, it felt a little too uh, crazy, but you know when I showed up somewhere new, no one knew me and I could just tell them, hey I'm a writer, um, there was no reason for them not to believe me, and I think gradually over time um, it actually became true. Yeah, you sure turned into one, and now you're the author of this book called The End of Jobs. What is The End of Jobs about? Uh, share with our audience The End of Jobs and its meaning. Sure. So The End of Jobs has a very simple premise. It's that entrepreneurship is going to be as essential of a career skill for the 21st century as uh, something as basic as literacy was for the 20th century. So the book talks a little bit about um, why that is and why this shift is going on and then kind of some actionable ways people can start approaching their life more entrepreneurially and gaining entrepreneurial skills. Was there anything that you found while writing the book that, uh, you know, just a, a major takeaway for you, something that maybe you weren't doing before that you're doing now? Yes, yeah, so I'll give um, one fact that really stuck in my mind. Uh, if you look at job growth uh, since 1983, you can sort jobs into routine and non-routine and creative uh, and non-creative. And the only sector um, that's shown consistent growth, or shown any growth, excuse me, since 1983, is creative non-routine work. Um, and I think that's, when you think about what entrepreneurialism or entrepreneurship is, that's the idea, right? It's something you're doing something new every day, it's not routine, and it's something that requires um, creation and innovation. And so thinking of how more to structure your work around, how do I do something creative, how do I do something innovative um, in a non-routine way is a very, um, a very durable way to think about your career. I should say so. Sir, where can people pick up The End of Jobs? Uh, so it's available on Amazon. It's probably the easiest place. Very good. The End of Jobs, author Taylor Pearson joining us today to talk about uh, changing your location and potentially changing your life all by the mask that you wear. You want to visit taylorpearson.me for more information and to check out more writings from this very prophetic gentleman here, a guy who has a lot of terrific insight when it comes to business. Taylor, thanks so much for being a part of the program. Thanks for having me on. You bet. All right. You stick with us, my friends, because we are going to continue down this road of talking success and reinventing yourself and doing something meaningful with your life. We've got another great author coming up for you straight ahead. Stick with us. The Millennial Report rolls on next. streaming live at ubnradiotv.com or live tweet us at hashtag millennial live this is the millennial report All right, before we move on here, I have got to know something. Tell me, do you like technology? Are you a fan? Yeah, I kind of thought that you were because I've got a series of studies here in front of me that all indicate that millennials don't just appreciate technology, we love technology. I think we like the fact that it makes our daily lives so much more convenient, right? It puts us at ease with a few clicks, a few swipes, it's taken care of. We can move on. We can do something else. And on the flip side of that, we are busier than ever. I know that my day-to-day -day is packed full of activities. I am always on my way to another event, to something else. But if you're like me, and I know that you are because you listen to this show, this is a place where we learn how to be better together. And so you're probably trying to expand your mind. You're probably attempting to be better in some way. I choose to educate myself through books, through reading. The biggest problem here is that dragging books around with me day to day is not at all practical. It's not convenient. I've got big bulky books. Where am I supposed to put them? I might have a bag with me, but that bag is fu filled with other things that I need for my day. So dragging books around with me is not practical. However, when I am on a 
train or in a car or on a plane, I've got a little bit of downtime that allows me the opportunity to plug in, which is why I adore Audible.com. Audible is the audiobook superstore online that allows you to download audiobooks to your tablet, to your digital device, and listen at your leisure. I probably have 15 audiobooks in my Audible queue right now that I haven't touched, along with 30 that I'm currently attempting to listen to, going back and forth and just plugging and picking up right where I left off when I have time. This is why I'm excited, because today, Audible has partnered up with The Millennial Report to offer you, our audience that we know is trying to be better, the opportunity to get a complimentary, free audiobook. Download your free audiobook right now at millennialive.com. That is our website, millennialive.com. Click on the headphones, you'll see the Audible logo underneath, and then it says claim your free book. It's as simple as that. Expand your mind today, start your Audible queue, and make sure that while you're at the millennialive.com website that you're checking out our past shows, that you're taking a look at our videos and learning more there as well. But click on that banner at millennialive.com and you'll get yourself not only a complimentary audio book of your choosing, you'll also have an opportunity to sign up for a 30-day free trial from Audible. They're offering you that too because you're a part of this audience. 30 days of as many audiobooks as you could possibly download. Imagine the possibilities. Imagine how you can be better with that on your digital device. MillennialLive.com. Check out the complimentary audiobook download right now. Just click on the banner at MillennialLive.com. Right back to it here with the best of a generation. You're locked on to the Millennial Report. Welcome back. Good to have you with us. Hey, we're talking success today. We're talking reinventing yourself and continuing to find your passion, drive that purpose home. And joining us now is James Maloney, author of the book, The Art of Success. Hi. Hi, Wade. How you doing? Hey, great to have you with us, sir. I know you're joining us now. Uh, I think it's early morning from Australia. Is that correct? Yes, it is uh, 7.20 in the morning here in Sydney, Australia. And as quickly... You pronounced my name correctly, oh, I'm so sorry. thank you very much for that. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'll mess it up next time, I promise. <laughs> Absolutely. Sounds good. Well, you know what? I, I, I love this concept of the book because it seems that you really did your homework. You dug down deep to find that success is more than meets the eye. There's an art to it. There really is. And mm -hmm. you, you kick things off. Um, by looking at sort of the foundation that we need in order to be successful. Can you tell us a little bit about that foundation and, and how we need to harness it? Yeah, so um, the structure of the book begins with the foundation, which is uh, accepting full responsibility for your life. And then I go on to talk about um, seven other pillars which are very important to creating success. But it really begins with that first part where you, where you get to a moment in your life and you say, you know, this is, uh, this is my life, this is up to me to take my life where I want to go, and yeah, I might be in a situation right now, or I might have some circumstances which I didn't create, and they might not be so good, but um, it's up to me how I react, it's up to me what books I read, it's up to me whether I um, really try and change that or not, and uh, that's really where success begins, in my opinion, because until you have that mindset where... Um, you've got that full responsibility for your life, then you're kind of playing someone else's game. You're following someone else's rules. It's, it's not you living your life, if that makes sense. Yeah, it absolutely does. And I guess my biggest question before we, we get into more of the pillars of success is to ask you why you felt inspired to write a book like this in the first place. What really motivated you to say, there needs to be a book about this art? That is a um, great question. It's a bit of an odd story. So I studied mathematics and finance in university, in university been very mathematical, uh, but I've always enjoyed writing too. And I've always enjoyed, enjoyed reading about this sort of literature. So I've been reading a lot of this stuff and I really, I thought that more people really needed to, to, to be exposed to this sort of information. And a lot of the books I read 
they were quite specific. So you'd you'd learn something about goal setting, or you'd learn something about time management, or you'd learn something you know in a bit of a niche. And I honestly thought that I hadn't come across a book which tied it all together holistically. And uh, one night, true story, literally, I was in bed, almost about to go to sleep, and this idea came to me, which I could see this book where it had this combination of quotes from extraordinary people um, and then supplemented by my own writing. And uh, I was... I almost went to sleep, but I got up out of bed, walked to my desk, wrote the idea down, fleshed out a tiny bit, went back to sleep, totally forgot about it until the next day when I woke up and found that piece of paper again. And uh, if I hadn't have gotten out of bed that night, I really don't think this book would have existed. But So I guess to answer your question, I felt people needed to have this type of information, but this specific book didn't exist because this one... I feel I try to tie things in quite holistically around the many different parts that we have to bring together to be successful. And I just wanted to share that with, with other people. So it's sort of a, an all-encompassing type of book, type of a multi, multi-principled multi book, if you will. Um, and yeah. I, I love the fact that, I mean, thank, thank goodness you woke up the next morning, uh, you know, uh, to find it there and, and continued on I'm your happy journey. too. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, very fortunate now to have this book in the world and um, certainly changing lives and affecting people. You talk about these pillars for success. Um, how did these pillars come to formation? Because there are seven of them, right? I mean, th- th- this is this is not simple. Um, this is not easy. You, you have to understand that success can sometimes be challenging. Um, and yeah. you've, you've got seven of them. Why don't you take us few, uh, through just a few of them and, and share with us uh, what you learned along the way with these different pillars? Yeah, sure. So uh, the way the pillars came came about, I had a rough idea at the beginning, um, areas about you know leadership, working well with others, about taking risks, embracing change, uh, setting your goals. So I had, I had an idea of um, the topics I wanted to talk about, but it was only until I'd actually done a whole bunch of the research and brought in a whole bunch of the information that I was able to kind of distill that down into, into the seven. And... Uh, I was making tweaks until the very end, actually, but um, we finally got the ones that are in the book now. And just to run you through them quickly, um, so pillar one is going to be perceive the world to your advantage. And this isn't about being delusional. It's about saying, yeah, you know, I think that I could learn the skills if I needed to and if I wanted to, to do almost anything. You know, no one's, not everyone's going to be Usain Bolt, but not everyone wants to be either. And it's, it's about looking at the world through a, an optimistic lens of, I could do that. Um, realistically, I could do this if I put my mind to it. Then we get to pillar two, which is always strive for growth. And this is the one that I struggle with the most, actually, because uh, we humans really are wired to stay in our comfort zones. It takes a lot to, to, to get us to leave. And it's, um, unless someone's there pushing you out, it's quite difficult to get yourself to leave, and I struggle with this one every single day, but it's, it's about how do I grow every day? How do I get out of my comfort zone so that I'm um, expanding? Then we get to pillar three, which is set your goals, plan, and execute. Kind of the nuts and bolts. Um, I have, uh, for a lot of the things I've achieved in my life, I've, I've set goals and I've broken them down into you know, exactly how I'm going to get there. And... When I do that, you know, nine times out of ten, I achieve what I set out to achieve. When I don't do that, I, it literally doesn't happen. And I think that's a pretty similar theme across all of my other uh, friends who have who've done great things in the world. Then we get to the next pillar, which is to um, work well with others. Well, actually, it's embrace change and take risks, I think. I always get the, the last three a little bit jumbled up. <laughs> but embrace change and take risks. So this is similar to the, to the one about um, always striving for growth, but... It really gets to the nuts and bolts of how do we change and why when, you know, consciously we say, I want to change, but then we, we don't. And this has also become really clear for me recently when I've realized that um, and until the pain of staying the same becomes less than the pain of changing, we simply don't do it. Uh, I, had a, I had an experience a while back where I just woke up one morning after, you know, a bit of a night out and I said, that's it no more drinking for me for at least a little while. And I'd said that before, uh, but this time the pain was real enough. And I said, it's just too much of a waste of the next day. 
I'm done. So until you get to that point where you say, that's enough, it's really, really hard to change. <laughs> uh, the, the, I'm sorry for taking too long here, but now we get to work well with others and strive towards leadership. Because the truth is, if you've got a worthwhile goal, you can't achieve it by yourself. And it's also you know, not that fun. You've, it's, it's enjoyable to, to meet other like-minded people and simply put, you know, we need each other to achieve the great things that we want to achieve in our lives. And then finally, to my favorite pillar, which is uh, see the big picture. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people can get lost in ambition and working hard and doing the grind. And uh, I, I probably wasn't the best role model for this when I was writing the book because I was working my full-time job, which is very demanding, come back in the evenings, write the book, write the book on the weekends. And it wasn't much of a balanced life. But, you know, you do have to realize that um, here we are on this planet Earth in the middle of, you know, this ridiculous universe, spinning, spinning, spinning. It's, uh, it's just trying to step back and see, see a bit of the bigger picture here. And it's, that's my favorite pillar by far. It's a fantastic pillar, sir. And I, I need to know, um, you seem like somebody who's, who's quite driven and who has been uh, very much inspired. And that's a beautiful thing because I think it's contagious and you can feel your energy. Um, tell Thank me, you. absolutely, you, you tell me, please, um, as you explore this book and you put it together, I mean, you reference throughout the book a lot of thought leaders who have mm -hmm. drummed up success and um, who have been very fortunate in their lives, who have worked very hard for what they have and who have achieved great things. Uh, can you share with us uh, a few of the thought leaders that most inspire you uh, in your journey? Sure thing. Um, I guess the, the key one which really inspired the book is a man by the name of Jim Rohn. And he's been, a, he's been a mentor to the likes of Tony Robbins, mm -hmm. uh, Les Brown, Brian Tracy, a few of kind of the, the pretty big um, self-improvement gurus of today. And something about his message was just so simple. Uh, you know, his, his story is that he was a farm boy from Idaho and grew up and he's, he's, he's changed the lives of millions of people all around the world. And the way he delivers his message just really cuts straight through to me. So he was, he's definitely one of uh, the biggest inspirations. Then um, I really look to, to people who um, kind of live in the space that I'm interested in. So right now I'm very big about entrepreneurship and people like Richard Branson are very inspirational to me. And I also find great inspiration from people like Mandela. It's a little cliche, but people who just had the most incredible challenges and they are still radiating positive energy. It's unbelievable. And it, may, it just puts into perspective my challenges. You know, I have, you know, I'm, maybe I'm sick for a week or something. I'm like, this is terrible. And then you've got Mandela who's um, wrongly imprisoned for decades. Yeah. And I'm like, well, <laughs> it puts it into perspective. You bet. I think that there's an awful lot of... Um, Obviously, we, we all struggle with challenges in our life, and we all struggle with the, you know, the, the uphill battle of trying to reach the success that we see as mm -hmm. um, you know, ultimately the, the end goal, right? We all see it at the, the end of the tunnel, and sometimes that tunnel seems so far, so long, so distant. Yeah. Um, and I know that we have a, a huge generation here that we call them the hero generation because in reality, us as millennials, I mean, we're, we're here to pick up the pieces. Uh, the, the world is not in good shape right now, and mm -hmm. uh, the hero generation uh, has arrived to help out a little bit. And right now, we're struggling. Right now, I, I know that many of us, we, we have goals and we'd like to have success, uh, but it seems like a very long, dark hallway ahead. Um, yeah. what, what sort of encouragement can you give uh, someone who sees something that they want, um, and you know this is putting it down to sort of brass tacks, very basic, very easy to understand. Mm -hmm. Somebody who sees that end goal, what they want, how they want to get there, but they have all these obstacles in the way, what would you tell somebody who feels like they just can't make it? Simply put, um, if you really want it, you just got to keep going. Obstacles are never going to go away. They're always going to be there. But when you become hungry enough, when you become motivated enough to achieve that, what happens is that the next ob obstacle arises. And this happened many times when I was writing the book, when I had problems with, with my vendors or whatever, whoever I was dealing with. It seemed like an unlimited, just 
a supply of obstacles keeping coming up, but I, I was just so focused on making it and so hungry to, to make this a reality that when they came up, I just knocked them down. Sometimes it took longer than I thought, but um, you know, to keep on going if that's what you really want. And this is also where you know, Pillar 7 comes in, see the big picture. So you can see an obstacle coming up and you, can, and you don't have to be so um, down about it because you understand that you know, life, the problem isn't that big in the grand scheme of things. So that would be my, my very simple advice. Keep on going and you'll make it there. And if you don't make it exactly to where you set out to, to make it, which happens very often, often you make it to just a place which is just as good, which you didn't realize, which you didn't see in the first place. Um, and this is what I found. A lot of goals I've set myself, which I haven't achieved, they've still been incredible goals because they've allowed me to, to grow and develop. And I ended up just somewhere to the, to the side type of thing. So tell me, what does success look like to you? Um, you're a guy now that has experienced quite a bit. You've done uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of very commendable things. You're an entrepreneur, a speaker, an author. You, you've done these great things now. Um, I can only imagine that once you reach sort of the pinnacle, you reach the success that you had set out for, now you reset and find another goal. You reset and you, you find the next level of success. Um, at, at what point do you realize next that you've reached success? What are you going for? Well, you, um, well at the moment, what I'm going for is to really expand my reach. So uh, right now, I've, I've got um, relatively limited potential to impact people around the world. And I want to, you know, it's a, it's a great skill to be able to to positively change the life of, of one person, but how do you really grow that? So one, 10, 100, 1,000, all the way up to you know, a million people. That's really what I'm aiming for right now. But I just wanted to mention that you touched on a very, very important point there where there's always a next level. There is always a next level to get to. And if you're defining success as X, something very static, then once you get X, um, you don't get that fulfillment or it's very temporary. And then you go, well, now I need to go to Y, which is the level above, which is, um, the, the way, which is why I try to think about success at the moment as uh, being able to, it's a little bit somber, but I think it's a good definition. It's being able to leave this world with contentment whenever that time comes, because I don't know how long I'm going to be here for. And if that's um, tomorrow, I'm not going to withhold my happiness for three days time when I achieve my goals. And um, so it's really about, doing the best every moment possible so that I know that I gave everything I could in the limited time I had and then I can be content when, uh, you know, when that moment comes. I love that and I also, I, I appreciate the fact that you uh, helped to define that by the way um, because you're right, it, it was something very um, important to touch on and I'm glad that you ended up uh, you know, further clarifying <laughs> it for us. When it comes to the idea of success and, and pursuing something to begin with. Uh -huh. You know, and you outline a lot here in this book, but in, in your studies and, and in the, the compilation of uh, bringing these stories together and bringing these different quotes together and learning from different thought leaders, I'm sure that you've seen a lot, I'm sure that you now retain a lot. In your opinion, how and, and, and this is, you know, if you're looking at another millennial right now, if you're yep. sharing this with a millennial, how do you determine whether something is worth pursuing or not? Um, how do you know? What would you say to them when it comes to that internal compass? Um, you know, if it's not worth the struggle, or if you, you absolutely want to put up the fight and you want to walk through fire to get to yeah. it. Um, if somebody's struggling with that, um, how how do they decide? Help them understand how they decide whether to go for it or not. Uh, brilliant, brilliant question. I. I'm going to mention two things here. The first is uh, you've got to learn to tune into your intuition. And it's, you know, this is definitely an art, not a science, but uh, what, what feels right. And when I went to write this book, it just felt very right to me. Uh, I, d I had a lot of doubt along the way, but I remember, I still I remember that feeling of, you know, this is what I need to do right now. Uh, so that's number one. So just try and tune into how you're feeling about this particular goal that you've set for yourself. 
And then number two is, and if you want to get a little, more, a little more practical, just think about what your life would be like once you achieved it. And is it going to actually be what you wanted? Now, it's, this is a bit difficult because you need to be realistic. And one of the things I talk about in the book is you've got to be smart enough to look down the road. Because if by the time you achieve the goal, you've uh, you know, distanced your friends and your family, you've got poor health, uh, maybe maybe it's not worth it. So just try and picture yourself in that situation where you've done what you set out to achieve and is your life um, at a place where you're happy with that. And uh, if, if it feels right and if, and if the answer to that question is yes, then I think that that's a worthy goal to pursue. I really appreciate you uh, helping to lay that out there because I have friends um, and, and I myself, of course, many times struggle with that and it's difficult to, to know and that certainly is some very helpful advice and definitely allows us the opportunity to at least uh, explore whether or not something is worth pursuing or not. Uh, I, I definitely agree, the intuitive nature of it, right? The, the butterflies, yep. as, they, as they say, the butterflies in the stomach, knowing that feeling. Um, that if it excites you and if it gets you into a um, almost a blissful like state almost a a state of you know th this this not only excites me but uh, I can feel like a vibration from it right I can feel yeah. um, this this really sort of uh, comforting and uplifting sort of uh, feeling so really? yeah I appreciate you uh, going down that road for us Welcome. And I just mentioned one thing. Now, don't be confused that you're going to have that feeling the whole way through. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the, it's pointing you in that direction, but there's going to be a lot of doubt. There's going to be a lot of insecurity um, along the journey. Frustration, or oh, frustration is a big one. Yeah. But, uh, and this is why when you have that feeling of, of bliss, write it down and just remind yourself why you're undertaking this journey. And then when you get to those challenging moments, you go back to where you, what you wrote down. You're like, this is why I'm doing this. I remember now. This book has a lot of content in it. I would uh, ask you to frame up for us uh, in if you if you could select three important takeaways uh, mm -hmm. from this book that a reader might get out of it. What would those three takeaways be? What three things stand out to you uh, from this book that uh, a reader would get the most amount of impact from? Yeah. Um, so the first one really is, uh, you know, this is your life, your life to live, and to a large extent, what you make of it is up to you. So that's number one. Then number two would be, if every day you can push yourself out of your comfort zone, grow a little bit, then success is pretty much guaranteed to be yours. And I say that because it is so damn hard to uh, push yourself out of your comfort zone every day. But look, um, you've heard, probably heard about using fear as a guide sure. to for what you need to do. And that's not always right because you, if, if you're talking about jumping off a cliff, you don't want to use fear as a guide. Yeah. But in a, within the realms of reason, you want to do that as a guide to so try find ways to grow. And then the last one really is, um, you know, don't don't get so caught up in your ambition that you become someone you're not proud to be. So, so the last takeaway is self-respect. Your own self-respect is perhaps the most valuable thing. Don't sacrifice that. Can I tell you how much I... Uh admire the fact that you are able to summarize hundreds of pages into uh, three <laughs> takeaways because that Thank is you. never that is never an easy question for anybody and um, <laughs> I'm, I'm reluctant to, to throw it at folks if I don't think that they can handle it so um, I believe that you could handle it and you absolutely did so thank you for summarizing you, yeah the, <laughs> those top three takeaways for us there no problem. this book the art of success is something that um, I find uh, to, to be very helpful if you're looking for for that all-inclusive answer and certainly you've given us a lot to chew on here today uh, but I heard you wanted to give us more you know Wade I was um, very excited to come and talk to you today because I know that there are some hungry people out there that they want to have a better life for themselves they want to have a better life for the people they love and they just want to have a better world so I would love to give your listeners a free copy of my book and I was reluctant to do it on one sense because people don't always value free things. They think, well, you know, it's free. But 
I feel like the listeners of your program are not going to fall into that trap and they're going to take the time to, to, to give it a read and get a lot of good value out of that. So that's my offer today. If your readers would like a, a free copy of my book, they can head to jamesmaloney.com slash millennial report and pick up the copy there. And uh, I really hope that you get something valuable out of it and that it maybe just corrects your course a little bit or, you know, I'm sure it's going to do that. There's, there's a decent amount in there, but I just, I also hope you, hope you enjoy the book, but that, that's what I'd like to offer your readers. Oh, your listeners, sorry. <laughs> no, you know what? <laughs> That's quite all right. Um, I greatly appreciate the fact that you would go to these links to, to impart this gift on our audience. They're, they're a very smart bunch. They're very intelligent. They're very wise. Um, and, you know, like I said, they're the hero generation. They're looking to do good. They need a guide map. They need all the help that they can get. Yeah. And this book allows us that opportunity. So I am incredibly grateful. And I know that our audience will be, too, those watching and those listening. Um, so once again, uh, jamesmaloney.com slash millennial report. Um, we have the uh, graphic up on the screen. So if you happen to be right. watching us, you can uh, take a look at that for all the correct spelling. If not, if you have trouble spelling that last name, it's M E L O. U N E Y M E L O U N E Y James Maloney dot com slash millennial report for the free digital download of the art of success. Excellent. Ah, James, I can't thank you enough for being a part of the broadcast today and also for giving us that uh, complimentary book. I, I, I mean, you, you worked very hard on this and we will not take that lightly. It means an awful lot to us. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. I uh, appreciate you dropping by and sharing with us the art of success and some of the pillars and some of the learnings that you took away from that. Uh, James Can I give Malone. two practical tips for your listeners? Oh, sure. Yeah. Go for it. So, um, two things you can do today that I think will, or I know will for a fact will, uh, will change your life. Uh, one, start a journal. So go buy an empty book and write in that. Um, find, a, find a routine that works for you. I write every second day or every day or every mm -hmm. second day. And it's about introspection and reflection. Where are you on your journey? Where are you going? How are you, how are you doing that? And then the second thing is read every day, 30 minutes. It sounds like a long time, um, but you know, 30 minutes out of the full 24 hours, if, if you read every day, your life will, in, in six months' time, your life will be so radically improved, you won't believe it. So those are my two practical tips. That's tremendous advice. James Maloney, jamesmaloney.com, and to pick up that free gift, it's jamesmaloney.com slash the Millennial Report. The art of success. Thanks for being a part of the broadcast today, Thank sir. you, Ed. You bet. My pleasure. All right, stick with us. The Millennial Report uh, continues, and uh, you know what? I told you we had something for you. We certainly do. Um, we need to, on this election day, lay America to rest, which is why directly after this, we go right into our commemoration video, an apology ahead of time uh, if you weren't prepared to say rest in peace. This is the Millennial Report. This is the Millennial Report with Wade He. USA, USA. My friends, thanks for being part of the Millennial Report, and uh, rest in peace, America. Of course, it's all tongue-in-cheek. I'm just kidding around. Uh, we want to celebrate how great this country is. However, uh, we have a long road ahead. We have a long road of healing ahead, and I hope that you'll vote today, and tomorrow begins the real work, us coming together and making a difference. The hero generation, millennials, we gotta. So join us as together we make a difference. This is the place where you matter and you make a difference, the Millennial Report. See you next time. The party doesn't end here. 
subscribe to the Millennial Report on YouTube for new videos every week. Just visit MillennialLive.com.